Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to our July webinar. We are honored to host the legend. I almost want to call him the father of fractures, uh, Dr. Ron Nelson. Ron, it, Ron has three degrees in geology. He has a bachelor's in invertebrate paleontology from Northern, from Northern Illinois University, an MS in igneous and trace element geochemistry, and a PhD in structural geology and rock mechanics, both from Texas A&M University. He worked for Amico and later for BP for 25 years in various technical and managerial positions, including serving as the first supervisor of Amico's Structural Geology Research Group, which I know is a great group and we have a lot of great work that's come out of that. Since leaving the companies, he started Broken In Consulting and has done consulting on structural geology and fractured reservoirs for 22 years serving 51 different clients worldwide. Ron has authored 121 publications, including three textbooks on fractured reservoir analysis, one that won the PSGD award for best seminal publication in 2018. His career has spanned from early work on qualitative assessment of reservoir fracture systems and core and outcrop to quantitative description of fracture systems from image logs and fluid flow to support numerical modeling of reservoir behavior with time. His work has always sought to merge geological, engineering, rock mechanics, and geophysical approaches to solve fracture behavior in the subsurface. So without further ado, I will pass it on to you, Ron, and let you take it from here. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, it's a real uh, pleasure to talk to this uh, very important group within the AAPG. And one of the groups that's actually growing uh, uh, as opposed to some of the others. So to talk about why we made this presentation, I attended the PSGD field trip last May uh, out of Marble Falls. It was led by Tom Ewing. It was a very interesting field trip looking at a lot of the faults in outcrop in the Llano Uplift area. Uh, some of the things we saw there were very important in terms of modeling fractured reservoirs. And so I put this presentation together to sort of address some of those. Uh, certainly, as uh, Ms. Turco pointed out, early in my career in the mid 70s, what we were doing was really looking at outcrops and core and trying to figure out where in the section most of the fractures would be, and then where laterally in map view might be the highest intensities. But we've come a long way since then in terms of understanding how to quantify fracture systems uh, in the subsurface and outcrop. Uh, and actually model those fractures. Uh, and we see here in blue on the right of the slide, uh, a goal, not the only goal, but a goal in fracture studies is to provide natural fracture data to create what's called a static conceptual fracture model. And that provides direct input to the creation of discrete fracture network models or DFNs. And those discrete fracture models can be input into a reservoir simulator. And we can figure out how these uh, different fracture systems, as well as the matrix, will respond uh, in terms of fluid flow and how it will respond over time. So this is probably the most important way uh, we quantify these fracture systems nowadays. Now, I had a book that came out in 2020, and we look at all of the 13 aspects of fracture distributions that we need to make a complete uh, fracture model. What we're gonna talk about today is really addressing only about four of those. Now, the nice picture in the center of the, uh, the slide is a DFN. It's a DFN uh, looking at the Bakken, and this is the antelope field uh, in the Williston Basin. Uh, and what we've modeled here is the section between the lodgepole and the three forks. Uh, 
with focus on uh, the Bakken. Uh, and what's modeled here are the matrix permeabilities as well as uh, the set one and set two fractures. Uh, and I think the, the threes as well. Uh, so we see a very nicely developed uh, uh, DFN. This was published initially in uh, uh, Buckner et al. 2013 at the AAPG. The model itself was put together along uh, with my help with Sebastian Bayer Prince, who now has his own consulting company. Now, the bottom line is what's shown in red, as far as I'm concerned, is we do a great job of reservoir modeling, but the reservoir modelers are not structural geologists. They are generally trained in stratigraphic approaches. And what I've found is that the structural geologists and the geomechanicists need to sit down with the, the uh, modelers to be able to input the right kind of data into these DFNs so that we get decent quality results. Okay, here is a, uh, Petrel model of the entire Williston Basin. And what we're highlighting in there is the two largest productive anaclines within uh, the basin. Uh, the Nesson anticline, which is a north-south feature, and oblique to that is the antelope field, which is the DFN we just showed you before. Most of the production out here started in the uh, carbonate reservoirs, the Three Forks, et cetera. Uh, but then once unconventional reservoirs came about, we started looking at the Bakken. And the Bakken is made up of three units, a middle Bakken, which is a grain stone, and two shale units above the middle Bakken and below the middle Bakken. Now, uh, we'll show you that uh, I was working with Marathon and when they first brought me in, they were telling me that what they were generally doing was fracking the two Bakken shales, the upper Bakken shale and the lower Bakken shale. And that uh, the carbonates uh, on uh, outside of those would be uh, constraining the fracture growth. And in fact, that didn't make any sense to me. And those of you who know, uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing and uh, mechanical properties uh, of rocks that are being fractured uh, would know that uh, they tend not to be constrained by those stiffer carbonates. And in fact, uh, after a couple of years worth of work there, we found that by doing um, RFTs in like the three forks above the upper Bakken shale, that those fracks were going straight up into the, the three forks. Uh, which made perfect sense. Uh, what we see on the right is core and a CMN, a compact, compact microimager from uh, one of the service companies. So we had uh, a long uh, CMI or image log throughout the, the well. And we also had core, 120 feet of core. Uh, we have image log data over the chord interval as well. Now, just to remind you that if you deal with horizontal core, there are some induced fractures that occur in the core that you have to be wise enough to know how to separate from the natural fractures. And why do we have induced fractures? Well, you've got to drag that core up through the heel of the well and the core is basically bent. And so you generate a bunch of usually mode one cracks across the, the core itself. Uh, so you have to first understand how to subtract out the induced fractures due to the bending of the core uh, and relate the, the resulting fractures to the image logs. Excuse me. Okay, the well details that we're dealing with. Uh, 
it was a, a horizontal well drilled by Marathon Oil Company uh, into what was called the seismic train wreck area in that it was very uh, disrupted, almost train wreck looking uh, seismic. Uh, and the well was drilled in Montreal County, uh, North Dakota in 2011. The data set included 120 feet of horizontal core taken just past the heel of the well and a 9,000 foot horizontal uh, service company interpreted CMI log. The log interpretations were not rigorous, regular, uh, regular, say, uh, QC'd by internal marathon staff. And in fact, nowadays, this is generally the case. Most companies do not do much QC uh, on the image logs or the image log interpretations taken by by the service companies. All fracture and bedding data in the CMI and core were analyzed by myself while I was consulting for Marathon. The core and image log interpretations were analyzed together to be able to validate the overall fracture interpretations and results. And pre preliminary results were initially published in Buckner at the AAPG in 2013. Uh, and in my latest book, Nelson 2020, both were cleared for publication by Marathon. Okay, just to hearken back to what uh, we all understand as structural geologists, is that faults tend to depict the state of stress that caused the fault itself. <clears throat> and this is a diagram from Anderson in 1905, which you, you see in, in many, many publications. So we're looking at normal faults, reverse faults, and strike slip or range faults. And those faults themselves dictate the state of stress at the time of faulting. And in fact, it also di dictates the majority of fractures associated with those faults. Now, what we see on the right is a schematic diagram looking at a small normal fault and a reverse fault, looking at the distribution of fractures around those faults. We see that we have fractures associated with the reverse fault, associated with the fault surface itself, but also away uh, from the fault surface. Uh, we see the same thing for the normal fault. And in fact, in general, the halos of fracturing surrounding the faults tend to be more uh, prolific in the hanging walls of those faults than the foot walls. So we, we tend to want to look at not only the high intensity fracture systems around the fault surfaces themselves, but also the background fractures associated with those same states of stress. Okay, this is basically a static conceptual fracture model uh, associated with a normal fault. Uh, and the terms that I use here are ones that I developed myself in 2002 and are slightly different than what we've seen uh, from some other publications since then. Uh, we have a zone of fractures around this normal fault, uh, and we call that, I call that the damage zone. Uh, and this is associated with the slip, slip surface. It is uh, high intensity deformation. It is a few feet wide. <coughs> it frequently shows relatively ductile behavior. Surrounding that, we have what I call an effective process zone of a few hundred feet uh, of fracture. Uh, and then we have away from that process zone background fractures, which are lower intensity, but still showing the same orientations and the same state of stress uh, as the fault itself. So why do I call this a process zone? By analogy to uh, Lochner and Byerly in 1977 and other papers as well, which looked at laboratory tests uh, associated with eventual through-going fractures. They took the samples up to various percentages of macroscopic failure. Uh, they looked at 
micro seismic events uh, within uh, that zone uh, prior to failure, um, and also uh, looked at the samples themselves uh, after they were taken to, to failure. Uh, and what we see is that the, there is a zone of microfracture activity that takes place prior to the through going slip uh, of the fault. And so it, these fractures are preparing the rock mass for a through going displacement a la sheer failure of the rock in terms of being a fault. So that's why I call this a process zone as separated from the damage zone uh, of more ductile behavior right at the fault surface. Okay, this is a schematic diagram. All static conceptual models must have some kind of a visual representation of them. Here is one representation for a normal fault. Uh, this is where we hang all of our quantitative fractures uh, data uh, associated with this normal fault. Okay, the first thing we do when we're interpreting, or at least I do, and I think we all should do, uh, when we start interpreting fracture interpretations within image logs is to look first at the bedding data. It's probably the best quality picks within the wellbore, and it shows you where there is structural disruption within uh, the data set. So here we have a plot of dip azimuth and bed dip magnitude uh, along this 9,000 foot long uh, wellbore. And we see there are numerous places within here where both the bedding dip magnitude and the bedding dip azimuth change. These are structural disruption zones and probably will show you differences in fracture intensity. <clears throat> Here we've taken those two plots and we've added, uh, added a fracture intensity curve. And this is a smooth fracture intensity curve, smoothed by uh, a boxcar moving average uh, of about 201 uh, one foot uh, measures. And here we see uh, higher fracture intensity uh, at zones where the bed dip and the bed magnitudes are, are changing rapidly. So these are tectonic features altering the structural geology within the wellbore. Now let's look at what the orientation of fractures are within this well, uh, 9,000 foot horizontal well uh, from both uh, CMI image data and the chord interval. And what we see for the entire well is a bimodal distribution of orientation, generally east-west in orientation. And these fractures shown in the pole plot uh, tend to be vertical or nearly vertical. So there's the entire data set from the 9,000 feet uh, from the CMI on the left. <clears throat> and now if we look at uh, just the chord interval on the right with the red box around it, uh, we see the CMI fracture orientation on the left of six fractures. And we have the uh, 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 core orientation with 12 fractures showing you a similar bimodal orientation. So now looking at this, we can say uh, that there are two orientations of vertical fractures, both uh, consistent within uh, the image log data as well uh, as the core data. So we have a good consistent data set in terms of orientation. Now, if we look at that fracture intensity uh, as in the, the smooth data, or we have it in two different ways, uh, smooth using a, a smoothing window of 11 samples, and also on the right, uh, the smooth fracture intensity data uh, with uh, 201 uh, one-foot samples smoothing window. 
what we see is we have six interpreted fracture corridors. In the upper diagram, we see in a standard Petrel disk view where the, the intensities uh, are the highest. And that map, uh, that display sits on top of a map of curvature at uh, the ice box or something just above a unit, just above uh, the basement uh, in the basin. Uh, so when we look at the fracture intensity curve laid out at the bottom, we see we have these six higher intensity fracture corridors. And in fact, those are made up of two peaks with an intervening lower intensity. If you think back to that schematic of the static conceptual fracture model, this is what uh, we would be looking at. A double peak might be the uh, uh, process zone of fractures surrounding the fault, and the lower intensity peak is more what would be the damage zone, what I would call the damage zone uh, toward the center of the fault. That can be because it's more ductile behavior, or it could be because uh, the intensities are so high, it's much more difficult to interpret fractures on the CMI uh, within those zones. The other thing to notice uh, is that the dashed blue line shows us an increasing fracture intensity in general along this 9,000 foot uh, well. There are more fractures within the corridors and the seven intercorridor zones, which we might call more background fracturing uh, within the well bore. Okay, let's look at the, the orientation of the fractures in those corridors. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going to tell you that I believe these corridors are fault related. And what we see is a very consistent uh, relationship of the orientation of the fractures within all six interpreted corridors. Now, if we look at both the rose diagrams and the pole plots for all six of those corridors, uh, once again, we see a bimodal orientation of fractures, and these fractures tend to be vertical or nearly vertical. We can interpret those distributions uh, in a strike slip model. And what you see at the top of the figure here is a right lateral strike slip model from Jamie Jameson uh, from an internal Amico publication, looking at the various elements uh, that occur within uh, the right lateral uh, fault system. And so what we show in the bottom there is the overall CMI orientation of fractures with an interpretation. I think the uh, uh, west, north, or east, northeast trending uh, uh, most abundant orientation would be what I might postulate is a Y shear. And the other one sitting at about 15 to 20 degrees to that might be perhaps the R shear in a right lateral strike slip fault system. Now, I was never a proponent of strike slip faults or wrench faults in the Williston Basin before I started working a, a number of wells in the basin. Uh, it didn't seem logical to me that we would have basement related wrench faults within this very moderately deformed basin. But in fact, I'm a believer now. There are a lot of these trends which Don Stone uh, defined by name are in fact probably like these are related to strike slip wrench faults. Now, if we look at the orientation of fractures on the left within the fault of fracture corridors and between the fracture corridors, they are basically the same orientation. If we look at the intensities, uh, uh, we can uh, distribute it between the fracture corridors on the top of the central diagram, uh, which is uh, in blue, and between the corridors, uh, which is in green below. 
Uh, and we see that while the orientations are the same, the intensities are very different. And in fact, the intensities within the corridors are at least uh, two times that uh, of what we might now call the uh, uh, background fractures between the faults. So we can define uh, and we can quantify the corridors and between corridor widths as well as the fracture intensities. Therefore, we would model both corridors and background fracture sets with similar orientations and inferred uh, states of stress at formation, but with very different fracture intensities depicting fault zone deformation. Okay, one thing that jumped out in the outcrops in the Llano area that Tom Ewing brought us to is that we have to pick a style to model the fracture systems associated with the faults. We basically have three style, styles uh, that we could use in terms of our model. One, the two sides of the fault are equal in deformation style and general abundance. And that's shown on the left diagram here, our outcrop photograph, uh, which is from the Triassic Jurassic uh, of the Colorado Plateau. Here we see a nice little normal fault. We have fractures depicting the normal fault state of stress, uh, ones that are conjugate to the, the fault slip surface and ones that are uh, uh, parallel to it. These are both uh, dominated by open fractures. The gentleman that you see there uh, are in left is the late uh, Chuck Kluth, ex-Chevron geologist, and on the right is Steve Laubach from Bureau of Economic Geology. And what we see in the center diagram is uh, style number two, where the two are equal in deformation style, but different in abundance on the two sides. And what was unusual about this Cambrian section at the Marble Falls area is that the hanging wall uh, really didn't have any fractures uh, associated with the fault at all. However, the foot wall did. We see fractures that are parallel to the fault in the foot wall as well as conjugate to it. And lastly, the third style are, are, is one where the two sides of the fault are different in deformation style. Now we're looking at the, uh, in the right diagram, once again, the Triassic and Jurassic of the Colorado Plateau, we're looking at a normal fault with a, a Navajo sandstone on the left and Cayenne siltstone on the right. Uh, the Navajo at the time of this deformation was definitely ductile. Uh, we see shear fracture development, but it's all by deformation bands. This is a rock of 24 to 27% porosity. When it is sheared, it is sheared by deformation bands. On the right, we have a low porosity, low perm uh, Cayenne sandstone, and it's deforming by brittle open fractures. So now we see an intense deformation zone along the fault, uh, but we see very different rock behavior on the two sides of the fault. Okay. Let's look at how we might model these fracture systems uh, in terms of their process zones uh, surrounding the fault. Here are two examples of fracture intensity decay away from the slip surface. And so uh, the one on the left, uh, is a subsurface example. Now this happens to be a normal fault from the middle bucket. Uh, once again, from a different well, and we're looking at fracture intensity uh, as measured at, uh, from an image log at different distances away from the fault. We see it from the hanging wall, and we see it from the foot wall. And once again, uh, we see that, uh, like in most cases, we have uh, a greater intensity of fracturing uh, in the hanging wall uh, as opposed to the foot wall. Uh, on the right, we see a published diagram from outcrop in volcanic rocks 
uh, from Liu uh, et al. in 2020 in the AAPG bullet. And once again, we see a decay of fracture intensity away from the fault in both the hanging wall and the foot wall. Uh, so we can define these uh, decay rates in fracture intensity and condition our, our static models and our uh, DFNs uh, by this intensity. So usually the fault, the side of the fault that moves or the hanging wall displays uh, higher fracture intensity. Part of that is probably due to sin and post slip uh, fracture as the hanging wall tries to move over an irregular foot wall. So what do we do? If we have some data from the subsurface uh, that uh, give us pairs of intensity versus difference from the fault, we know from many observations that the fracture intensity decay rate tends to be exponential in nature. So if we draw a slope of a fracture intensity and best fit the slope, uh, we can condition the DFN uh, to an exponential decay from even limited data uh, to give us uh, the modeling parameters we need. Okay, here we see uh, DFN, this happens to be one from the middle Bakken once again. We have a discrete fracture model that has been generated associated with a normal fault. And we can turn that then into an upscaled permeability model of the fault. Uh, and this is, this is what's done in the, the, for the reservoir simulator. And this is a pair of diagrams courtesy of Sebastian Bayer. Okay, in terms of conclusions and context, uh, a quantitative static conceptual fracture model gives constraint to a quality discrete fracture network model that can be used then to predict reservoir performance over time using reservoir simulators. So we can start this whole process from a structural geology point of view by defining what our static conceptual fracture model is, uh, hanging all of our distribution data uh, on that, uh, and then create the DFN and use that to condition uh, the uh, reservoir simulator. And this presentation highlighted hopefully an exceptional example of subsurface fracture data used to quantify a fault related portion of a static conceptual model as input into the DFN creation. And once again, as pointed out in my 2020 book, there are 13 different uh, distribution aspects that we need to quantify uh, to be able to do these static conceptual fracture models and DFNs. What we've talked about so far is just four of them. So in the oil and gas industry, reservoir models are very savvy computer uh, proficient individuals with generally sedimentary and stratigraphic expertise. And I can tell you going around the world to different uh, national oil companies and major oil companies, they often take uh, very computer savvy geologists who just joined the company and give them the task of creating DFN. However, they don't have a clue what data to put into those models from a fracture point of view. These individuals that are doing the modeling are not generally structural geologists or geomechanical geologists that are familiar with natural fracture formation or distribution and generally lack the databases and expertise to adequately constrain fractured distribution in the models. This is what you folks need to provide. 
to the modelers. Done correctly, the structural geologists, in my opinion, uh, are needed to, to quantify fracture data and forms of fracture distribution functions to input into the DFN. And in fact, this person should sit at the workstation with the computer model, modeler for input and guidance as the DFN is created. So that's my soapbox, and hopefully I can uh, get you excited in helping uh, generate high quality static conceptual fracture models and DFNs that can point the way to whether our reservoirs will be economic over the long term or not. Okay, here is a list of the references that are cited uh, within the presentation. And hopefully you might find it interesting enough to go to my 2020 book, which details how we can get all of these various data uh, from different kinds of data, whether it be remote sensing or image log or core or outcrop or geophysical data or mechanical data. Uh, that's just a picture of what the book looks like from uh, Wiley and Sons. Thank you very much for your attention and I certainly take some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Ron. That was really great. There's a lot of hands clapping down there. Um, really great presentation. I'd love to kind of pass this on to all of my reservoir engineers and make them watch it. Show them how they need structural geology for their models. Okay, uh, we have two questions that have come in so far. If you guys have questions, we have a little Q&A box. Feel free to type them in there. That's an easy way for me to keep track of them. Um, you can use the chat. It's just easy to get lost in there. And if you have a burning question you want to ask out loud, I think there's an option for you to raise your hand in there and then I can allow you to talk. Um, but the first question comes with comes from Attila. How could the wellbore bias, so the deviation of the wellbore, how could that have affected your data set? And then what was the base to postulate one set of fractures as Y shears and the other as R shears? Well, the uh... The basis for interpreting the uh, the fractures from their orientation uh, has to do with the fact that we have two orientations that are basically vertical fractures. They're they're not associated with any kind of normal motion or reverse motion, and so one starts thinking about. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, horizontal offset or strike-slip offset. Uh, the orientation for the dominant fracture set versus the secondary fracture set infers that it might be a right lateral system with Y shear and R shear. It is an assumption that the most frequent would be something associated with the fault itself and that the, the uh, less dominant orientation would be some shear associated with it. If you recall on the diagram, I showed uh, uh, Y shears and R shears, there was a question mark associated with those. Uh, at best, this is, uh, a conclusion based on orientations uh, and the fact that we see no offset uh, along uh, these interpreted faults. Uh, certainly there can be a horizontal motion to them, but there was nothing uh, in terms of the middle Bakken or the, uh, or the Bakken shales that say that we had offset at the top and bottom of the box. So that's sort of why we decided on that. Uh, what was the first part again? Um, how could wellbore bias, so like the deviation of the wellbore, how could that have affected your data set? 
uh, certainly uh, the orientation, and I didn't show you what the orientation of the well bore is, but certainly if I'm uh, putting some credence to the difference between uh, the Y shear orientation and the R shear orientation, the uh, well bore orientation would make a big difference. We know these are east west, uh, roughly east west uh, trending fractures. If we change the approach angle of the well bore, we're going to uh, change the sampling of those various fractures. We assumed, I, I, I don't remember right now exactly what the orientation of the well bore was, but uh, we sort of took that into account uh, in terms of uh, the fractures, but uh, certainly well bore orientation uh, oversamples some orientations and undersamples others. Uh, yep, that, that could be a problem. We didn't think it was in this case. Okay, okay. That, that almost answers the second question as well, but let me go ahead and read it in case you have anything to add. This is from Rodrigo. He asks, how can we be sure the fracture intensity we calculate from wells is not biased by orientation? If so, how can we correct for it? For example, a vertical well would hardly cross any vertical fractures. Um, do you have anything to add or do you feel like you kind of answered that with that first one? Well, there are ways we can adjust uh, adjust intensities okay. uh, by knowing the orientation of the fractures and the orientation of the well bores. And I've, I've gone over such things where we can create uh, the appropriate intercept rate perpendicular to different fracture sets. Uh, it, certainly not easy, uh, but we can do it. I, it was not done in this case, uh, but yeah, that, that's a, a standard thing that we have to address uh, when we're dealing with uh, horizontal well bores or uh, lines of uh, scan lines uh, outcrop. Uh, yeah. You have to be able to uh, adjust fracture intensities that you see. Okay, awesome. Um, there is a note on here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, great talk. We'd like to get Ron's contact info for follow-up. So um, if, if you want to email us at PSGD or email me at me, me I'm Molly Turco at Turco Tectonics at Gmail. I could get you in contact with Ron or um, I don't know, Ron, if you have a, a website. We or... can, you can share my, uh, my email address, no problem. It's Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N underscore consulting, C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G at hotmail.com. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, next question from Kamal, how to model fractures away from where you might have well control? Are there any good rule of thumbs? Well, yeah, um, we've plowed that road a lot over the years. Uh, we can do it by understanding structural genealogy and by you know, so where we're going to get higher strain areas versus lower strain areas and looking at the mechanical properties of the rocks themselves, how brittle versus ductile they are. Uh, there are a number of things you can do. Uh, it really depends on what kinds of rocks you're dealing with and what kinds of structure you're dealing with. For instance, if we're dealing with uh, um, regional fractures, they're going to be pretty well distributed uh, in a homogeneous, relatively homogeneous manner, uh, regardless of whether you're on structure or off structure. Uh, everything we've seen about regional fractures are that they tend to predate uh, local structure. Mm -hmm. So if we're dealing with those, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have a high confidence 
that whatever properties we have of the system in one area is going to be similar in other areas. Uh, if we're dealing with fault related fractures, uh, you know, things are going to die off pretty quickly. Uh, and it's much more difficult uh, to make predictions uh, away from uh, local control. If we're dealing with folding, uh, we know a lot about strain patterns in folding and where uh, we understand uh, the fractures in one area and one strain regime, how they might increase in strain uh, away from that well bore as we go, say, to the hinge zone of the fold, uh, or as we go to the nose of the fold. So there are ways that we can use structural modeling uh, in folding to be able to make uh, estimates of how we think our fracture intensities and, and also the uh, morphology of the fractures are going to change away from our control. Uh, there are places where the strains get too high uh, and we go from uh, brittle behavior to totally ductile behavior. So rather than getting an increase in permeability, we get a decrease in permeability. So in this case, we merge what we know to be uh, the understanding of fractures where we see them and uh, where structural modeling tells us things are going to change and in what way it's going to change. Okay. But therein lies uh, you know, how we make our predictions based on rock mechanics and structural geology. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question from John Cassiano, what is the scale of the block diagram? I think that was maybe one or two slides back. I did see some wells in there, but I wasn't sure about how big that area was. This? Um, let me see. There's a little bit of a delay. Yes, that, I think that was it. Um, I don't recall. Uh, it can vary depending on the models that you're making, but those wells, you know, uh, uh, those, those are two, three wells, four wells, uh, and what you're looking at are the, uh, uh, the different tops within those wells, the Lodge Pole, the Mission Canyon, uh, et cetera. So hundreds of feet, okay. certainly. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, if, I don't know if, if you can go back, but there's a question from Natalie Givens. If you could show the data set on slide six, the graphs of fracture intensity versus bed strike, um, where were those, how, what, what were those generated from again? Uh, which which uh, slide six you said? Yeah, slide six. It was fracture intensity versus bed strike, or fract oh, fracture okay. intensity and bed strike. Maybe it was slide seven, possibly. Is it this one or the previous one? Um, let's go with that one. And Natalie, if you're still on, if you want to, if you want, I can unmute you if you're still there. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Yeah, no, it was actually the previous slide. Um, okay. Was trying, we're um, looking at something similar and was trying to figure out the type of the data that went into this particular analysis piece. Um, okay, did, this, is, this is all CMI data, mm -hmm. all CMI data. Yeah. Did, and that's Weatherford, right? Um, yeah. Um, did they provide you with like an LES file that had the count of fractures oh, yeah. per foot? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they 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 give you the depth of each interpretation. Mm -hmm. When I do fracture intensities, 
uh, I break the well into uh, sample windows. And that in general, it's gonna be like one foot. In some international examples, it might be a meter or a half a meter or whatever. So I make an equal number of samples. And then if there's no interpreted fracture in there, I go to zero. If there's right. two interpreted fractures, that foot, I put two. Uh, and then I'll smooth that data. And we smooth the data generally so that the curve comes out less spiky. Yeah. And it also matches better our wireland, wireline logs. Mm -hmm. So you get a much better relationship between uh, the fracture intensity uh, as interpreted and whatever other log data you're taking. Now, these are, you know, just uh, raw data. We haven't smoothed these at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the next the next slide shows your, your smooth data set with your um, well, interface. The next slide yeah. shows the smooth, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah, here the the bed strike and the and the um, bed dip uh, are are just uh, they're not smoothed at all. Okay, it's just as where where they see them. Um, Got it. And and so I really. I really think it's important when you look at fracture intensities, the first thing you have to do is analyze the bed dips because they're going to tell you what your structure is like that the fractures are responding to. It's also true too that I believe they interpret the fracture, uh, the bed data first and they do it from one spot to another, from one depth toward uh, another, so that they're looking at more continuous bed dip changes. Uh, and so that's a, a good data set to, to relate everything to. Now, the other thing is I said that, that uh, there was no QC done on these interpretations. That is an important thing to do. And I've developed my own uh, procedure for QCing both the images and the image log interpretations. There's some big differences between companies and interpreters. And in the past, uh, what companies like Schlumberger did was take the youngest person uh, in the shop who was an interpreter and they'd have them do the image log interpretations. And so they didn't have very much background. Uh, and to, for example, they didn't know what you wanted the data for. So they'd see a bunch of partial fractures uh, that didn't have complete sinusoids to them. Mm -hmm. And so they'd say, well, there's a bunch of them in here, but they're all about the same orientation. So we'll only record the ones that are full sinusoids. Well, what's that going to do for you when you're trying to model fracture distribution and fracture intensity? They've just thrown a bunch of your data away. Uh, also, I did a, a study in a field called Hasiraskoya in um, uh, Russia. And the stuff was terrible. The stuff was terrible. Uh, the images were extremely poor uh, and the interpretations were extremely inconsistent so that you could put very little faith in the data set that, that you were looking at. So uh, if you're going to do a number of wells in a particular field, first of all, have the same image log and try to have the same interpreter doing every one uh, of uh, the images. 
uh, and then make sure you do a QC up. Thank you, you very much. Are you able to go one slide up? I think you had a block diagram. If you go one slide up, we were curious if that was created to a certain scale. It, it was the the block diagram with the fault and the little damage zone surrounding that. It was slide oh, okay. slide five. That one. Um, let me see. There's a little bit of a delay on my end, so it always takes a second. Yep, that's it. Yep. Was that, did that have a scale to anything or is that kind of just relative? No, no scale. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, for any kind of static conceptual fracture model, you need some kind of a visual mm -hmm. so that your engineers and your geophysicists and the other geologists know what it is you're talking about. And it gives them a context from which to hang those quantitative data sets for orientation. Uh, you're going to you're going to want to have a distribution function of orientation. You're going to want to have a distribution function for decay rate uh, uh, away from the well. You're going to want to have a different distribution function for that damage zone versus the process zone. Okay. Uh, so it is definitely a schematic, but it becomes more than a schematic when you start hanging the quantitative data on it. Okay, awesome, awesome. So this could be a small fault of a few feet. It could be, you know, a 2,000 foot fault. Awesome. Um, we might have time for one more question, maybe two. Uh, this one comes from Alina. What was the origin of vertical fractures in Bakken? Are there only tectonic fractures or some fractures that could be related to earlier diagenetic phases? Um, good question. Uh, there is a very strong set of regional fractures within the Bakken. Uh, they tend to be not orthogonal fractures, but a single direction. Uh, of regional fractures. And we can map that out across much of the, the basin. We can also map out what the orientation of the uh, maximum horizontal stress is too. Uh, so there are definitely uh, regional fractures, single direction or regional fractures that is uh, prevalent. We also have things that are local like the fractures associated with the faults, which will have a different orientation to them than the regional fractures. And then like antelope field, when we do have some folding, we're going to have another whole distribution uh, of fractures that are associated uh, with the axis of the structure and the hinge zones and the flanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, now in terms of diagenetic fractures, I haven't seen anything I interpreted as diagenetic fractures in the Bakken. Now, if we're talking about the three forks, I think we do have some of what we interpreted to be uh, fractures related to diagenesis, but not that I've interpreted uh, in the Bakken. Okay, okay, awesome. One more very quick question from Kwikwi Wang. She says, great talk, thanks for sharing. And she's looking forward to reading your 2020 book. She had a question on the fracture intensity slide. It looks like elevated intensity correlates with curvature. So then the question, is the variation in curvature due to faults or something else? And that might be a big question, but hopefully we can knock it out pretty quick. Um, how do you interpret curvature here? Is it that the change in the bedding? Um, it's possible on slide nine, there might be a picture of curvature on there. Let's see. 
unfortunately, let me check which slide nine is. Oh, okay. This slide here. Yeah, I oh, wasn't sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you're you're right. Um, in the upper diagram where we have the disks of the fractures and the fracture intensity curve associated with it, underneath is uh, a curvature map. Okay. Uh, and that's it. I believe it was the ice box level, which is sitting right above or near uh, the basement. Uh, and yes, there is curvature down there uh, at that unit. Uh, and that was one of the things uh, that was that people were interested in seeing if they could follow up whether these faults up uh, at the Bakken level and the uh, uh, were related to faults at depth that had high curvature at say the basement level. Uh, and if so, you could uh, seismically map those uh, and predict where we're likely to have uh, the faults and therefore more fractures. And in fact, if you look at that, that well horizontal well bore uh, in the upper diagram, uh, sort of toward the center of the well, you see some high fracture intensity uh, zones, one doublet in particular, uh, that gets into high blue or light blue, uh, one might be able to map the curvature at the icebox level and find those faults, which evidently are vertical, uh, and find fractures in the box that way. So yes, uh, there was uh, an approach to using geophysics to define curvature at a deep, deeper level uh, and uh, maybe predict where those occur up at the bucket. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I, I hate to end it, but it's already after one o'clock and we've had so many good questions and um, you, guys, you guys know where to find Ron. I put his email in the chat and he's got so much great literature out there. It was really an honor to have him here today. And we were able to record this webinar. We'll, we'll likely put it on YouTube. I'll double check all the permissions first um, so you can watch it again, pass it to your reservoir engineers. And Ron, just a big sincere thanks. Do you have any last words? If not, I can let you go. You can go enjoy some lunch. No, it was a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.